We're going to start uh, today with uh, Chef Pierre. Chef Pierre is the head of the uh, culinary arts department. Um, and he's going to start this presentation off with kind of talking about what he's going to do. And then it's going to come back to me and I'll do the history of chocolate, right? Okay, yeah, I'm going to make a very simple candy, which is called a cluster. And what it is, is toasted nuts, it can be almond, peanut, cashew, uh, maybe not walnut, because it's not really toasted, it's a skin, they tend to taste bitter. And uh, melted tapel chocolate that you mix with, and then you make bitter milk, as it said. So it's very, it's very simple. Um, we, uh, for this demonstration, we use um, a free tray organic chocolate. Um, and uh, it's a little strange because in all those years I've never worked with this chocolate. And there is a, there is a process when you work with chocolate, you need to melt it to a certain degree. And then you need to cool it down and then you hold it at another temperature. If you don't do that, the chocolate is either not going to set, meaning that it's going to be, when you put it in your hand, it's going to melt, or it's going to, it's going to bloom, it's going to turn white. And I'm sure you have bought chocolate in the past that when you open the, the chocolate bar uh, from white, it doesn't mean that it's 10 years old. It just means that it was probably on the sun, or it got warm, it melted, and then when it, when it cooled down, the fat inside bloomed, make those crystals like that. So that's why we go through that process of warming it up to melt all of the different crystals that melt, melt at different temperatures, and then we cool it down to you know, 29 Celsius, which I can give you in We cool it down to that degree and then warm it up a little bit. So we every, all the crystals set and then we warm it up just enough to work with. Uh, if you don't do that, the chocolate is not going to work. If you mold it, it's not going to come out. Um, there is a, another alternative if you don't want to go through that. You can buy that, that is called chocolate coating, which is a uh, fat a different fat, because this chocolate has cocoa powder as a fat, which is a, a fat that comes in the cocoa pot, in the cocoa bean. Uh, the coating, they took that fat off and they put hydrogen or something, palm oil, coconut oil, coconut oil. Uh, that, that chocolate, you can melt and it's going to set nicely. That is not, it's not as nice. It's the kind of chocolate that stick to your, your teeth and the top of your mouth. So what I did, I chopped the chocolate. I like to use a serrated edge knife when I chop because I know that the teeth of the serrated edge knife kind of hold the chocolate. If you cut it with a chef knife, it tends to you know, fly away. Um, and the smaller you chop it, the easier it can get. So if you say it's time here, you're going to spend a lot of time there. And uh, I think that's... Okay, and now back to me. <laughs> Uh, I forgot to mention my colleague Wendy Hornsby is going to come in and, and also aid in a little bit of this lecture. So I wanted to mention her because she's going to be coming in. Uh, I have a quote here from the Popol Vuh, which is essentially the Mayan, uh, kind of like the Mayan Bible that's often referred to. It, it gives us the cosmology of uh, the Maya. And when we start with the history of chocolate, we have to mention that it originated in the lowlands here of what was the Mayan civilization, right? Uh, the Mayans uh, occupied territories that include uh, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula here, right? The city centers like a Tikal, right? The, which is really a, a lovely place to visit with all kinds of uh, beautiful temples, as is Chichen Itza, you know, Jibin Khaldun, there's other smaller uh, temple complexes there. And um, what we know is that the Mayan were the first to cultivate uh, cacao, um, and they utilized it uh, in a drink for the most part, right? Although new evidence, and I'll mention this in a second, is, is actually challenging that it was only uh, used as a beverage. Uh, eventually, though, the Mayans and the, the Aztecs, there's an overlap in the post-classic period, right, between the 10th and the 16th century. And so um, the Mayans actually became kind of the suppliers of cacao for the Aztecs. Uh, and uh, really because it mainly grows in this area here, 
uh, and it's a low yield crop. So they kind of were the main traders of uh, cacao. So the Mayan and Aztec use of, of cacao, uh, cacao is a Mayan word, it just refers to the bean. Uh, chocolate comes from an Aztec word, which is chocolat, um, which means bitter water, because it was very, very bitter. As you know, if you've had, you know, uh, chocolate, a dark, dark chocolate, you know, 90%, it's kind of tough, uh, to, tough to eat. Um, chocolate was not, you know, traded in bars and things like that. It was a drink, and that's why I like this picture here of, uh, you know, essentially, you know, somebody having a frothy drink. But it was nothing like, you know, our hot cocoa. It was very spicy. Um, the uh, Aztecs mixed it with things like chili. Uh, they mixed it with blood. They mixed it with honey. Uh, and it was predominantly a beverage. However, just this last summer, uh, they found archaeological evidence of a plate, a Mayan plate, that has a residue of chocolate or, or the cacao. And now they believe that perhaps the Mayan actually used it also as a condiment, right, and as a sauce. Um, did you have a question, Lisa? I was just curious, you mentioned, for example, are Absolutely. Yeah. Human sacrifice was a big part of Mayan and Aztec uh, culture. And this was, uh, chocolate really was uh, meant for the upper, the nobility and the warrior classes. It was ceremonial. Um, the priests were actually, I should say, the priests were cautioned not to drink coffee. Coffee was looked at as kind of like cigarettes. And there were warnings, you know, like it will make you lazy. <laughs> And so mostly it was the nobility, it was the warriors. Uh, if they were honoring a soldier, right, uh, they, would, they would drink this as a ceremonial, in a ceremonial use uh, and before battle. Um, it was also used, there seems to be some evidence of perhaps some weddings, uh, funerals, maybe some ceremonies uh, such as that where maybe the common people might right, in this uh, cere ceremonial uh, event, you know, uh, might engage in, in drinking chocolate. Uh, it was also used for medicinal purposes, which is interesting because today, you know, now scientists and doctors are always talking about uh, the great, you know, effects of drinking or eating chocolate. Dark chocolate is actually good for your health. Um, and I love this. Uh, I love this image that Wendy, Wendy Hornsby, my colleague in history, supplied for me, which, uh, what is this that we're looking at? Can you stand up and just because, you know. The, the Aztecs were very, um, uh, what do we say, orthodox about sexuality or sexual, uh, what should we call it? Fooling around. Um, and uh, it not only, it, sex, was only se sex was only really sanctioned within a marriage, but um, sex was a very important part, well, sex is an important part of life. It was a very important part of, of ritual life as well. And there was a tremendous interest in herbs and other things that were aphrodisiacs. And this is, uh, there are cacao beans on the, on the bottom here. Uh, we have the goddess of fertility. Don't ask me to pronounce her name, it has eight syllables. Um, the goddess of fertility on the right with the flowers on her head. And it's interesting, the symbolism with the cacao, because the cacao plant, when it blossoms, it has flowers all over its trunk and its stem and its top. So the goddess of fertility is often the goddess of chocolate. So she's being presented by uh, this green god figure to, I don't know, some poor fellow. <laughs> All right, so um, we're talking about Mayan and Aztec use, that it was, um, it was actually a drink, it was a beverage, uh, it was used for ceremonies, warriors, the aristocracy. But what's interesting is at this time, period, money actually grew on trees, right? Um, the cacao bean was currency. And we know this because in his wonderful letters to Mexico, Hernan Cortez, you know, who is the conqueror of the Aztecs, a wonderful story if you ever get to uh, uh, study history. Um, he talks about, he writes uh, Charles V and mentions, you know, uh, the cacao beans, you know, you can, a hundred equates to a slave. And, you know, notice that the, the tomato, which originated in the Western Hemisphere, is one uh, cacao bean, right? Um, so it was, it was part of the, the currency, right, system of the Aztecs and the Maya. Now, 
let's talk about how, um, how cacao was exported into Europe. Now, um, cacao was essentially, uh, it, was, it was from you know, these regions in Central America, and it was really the discovery of the Western Hemisphere that, that changes everything and brings uh, cacao and chocolate to uh, Europe. Um, and part of this was after the discovery of, you know, Columbus. And by the way, Columbus, uh, 1492, is a red letter date in history. And it's a red letter date in history. Not, you can love or hate Columbus, right? But the fact is, after that date, the world changes, right? It will never be the same. Not just in the Western Hemisphere, right? Not just the native peoples there, but also in Europe. And also, you know, Africa gets dragged into this too, right? Um, and so, really, the, the expression of the massive exchange of ideas and foodstuffs and flora and fauna um, and disease, biological agents, you know. Um, in the 1970s, Alfred Crosby, who's a historian, he coined the term the Columbian Exchange using, you know, Columbus's name, right, saying that everything changed after 1492, right? You think of things like uh, a European food that, that uses tomato sauce. Who are you thinking of? Go to a restaurant and lots of tomato-y sauces. You're going to order Italian, right? Guys, you can think you, your marinara sauces in your pizza. You've got to think Columbus. Tomatoes come from the Western Hemisphere, right? Potatoes come from the Western Hemisphere. So uh, next time you take a shot of vodka, think of that. You can thank Columbus. <laughs> So anyway, um, the Colombian exchange, right? Uh, and cacao was part of this. You see the bean right here. Right? Uh, it was part of this Colombian exchange. Uh, and here I'm going to defer to my colleague who's going to talk about how also Europeans adopted uh, these New World products and changed it. So, um, as an example of the effects of the Colombian exchange, because here you see this, this multi-regional blending of cultures, which the Colombian exchange does create, this mass cultural diffusion, a great sharing. Um, first, I want to show you some of the, the sharing of language that always happens when, when cultures collide, it, among, among other things, is this sharing of language. And so some of the words, or many of the words, they come from the original Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs and the Mexica and in some aspects of the Maya before, um, how they translate almost exactly as they were in the original Nahuatl. Chocolate was pronounced chocolate, right? Chocolate, well, chocolate. Tomato, or tomato, it's actually tomat. That L is somewhere in the back of your I can do it. Tomate and tomato. And the avocado. Uh, the avocado. Avocado is a wonderful Nahuatl world because so many of the words are metaphors uh, that are very interesting and very descriptive. Avocado, when you look at the shape of the avocado, uh, the word means the testicles of the gods. Right? And many of the words, as Mary has said, uh, chocolate means the bitter water. There are multiple, uh, multiple words combined. They give you this wonderful picture or description within the word. Um, I'd like to talk a little about mole, this example of cultural diffusion. I love mole. And it's interesting, as Mary said, chocolate was used ceremonially uh, by the Maya and the Aztec. And it continues to be used in cooking ceremonially. Um, chocolate is now part of mole, which is the traditional uh, Christmas sauce. And I think it's one of the traditional Christmas sauces because it, it has so many ingredients and it's rather complex to make. But if you're going to make it, make a giant pot. <laughs> and it freezes beautifully. I've given you uh, an adaptation of uh, somebody's version of the original mole that was made late in the 16th century at a convent in Puebla, Mexico. Puebla is outside the uh, regions of both the, the uh, Aztec and the Maya. So it's not an area where you wouldn't have found chocolate until the Europeans began using it 
within the within Mexico, right? So they're going to adapt the foods that they find in this new region to their technology of of cooking, uh, and they're going to bring things that are coming in from around the world. So the nuns, the story is that there were nuns in the what is it, the convent of uh, Santa Rosa de los Angeles in Puebla. Uh, the archbishop was coming to visit, so this is a this is a major event. And they didn't have anything appropriate to serve him for a meal. So they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And an angel brought to them the recipe. <laughs> Believe it or not, the angel brought them the recipe. I think this is everything in the house. Okay? And what you have here are chiles from, and um, you know, the waddle word for chile is chile. <laughs> um, we have sesame from the Mideast. We have bread from Europe, um, chocolate from, the, from, of course, the New World, um, tomatoes from the New World. And then if you look on your recipe, you can see this vast list of spices. Cloves, um, where are they? Cloves, there's allspice, and so on. These come from Asia. And so they've come on the trading ships from some other part of the globe into Mexico. And all of this gets thrown into the same pot. I'm a big fan of mullets. I hope you do try this, but invite a lot of people over because it is a big pot. Mm -hmm. I was looking for some in the freezer yesterday to see if we still had some from last time. I can sit with by the way. So I think this is just a, a good example of what uh, Mary's describing as that Colombian exchange. All right, so now let's talk about how cacao goes to Europe. Chocolate was unheard of in Europe until the 16th century. The Spanish were the first Europeans to encounter cacao, as I mentioned uh, in the records of Hernán Cortés. Um, and eventually it was imported into Spain. And they created a drink, but they made it more palatable. They lost the blood aspect. And uh, instead, they started to mix it with sugar, right? And uh, this was all the rave, right, in Europe. And I actually have been to this place in Seville, where uh, there's it's this lovely, um, house of the aristocracy and they have these tiles and you come up to the tiles and I was looking at it I'm like what are they doing and I read in there they're, they're essentially it's like in this home they want to display that they are at the cutting edge of social culture by serving chocolate right uh, you know this is really uh, showing how exciting you know having chocolate that was what you wanted to serve your guests uh, and ooh and awe them and impress them uh, this is an uh, advertisement uh, from France, and notice they're using a version of the Aztec uh, word, chocolat or chocolat. Um, <laughs> so now that we have this sweet tooth in Europe, this actually has more of a sinister uh, legacy, and that's where we get the dark legacy of chocolate. A cacao's sinister past is actually um, the association of slavery with sugar plantations. Uh, many American, my students, you know, my U.S. history class, they automatically, when you talk about slavery, they think cotton, cotton, right? Actually, uh, slavery and sugar are historically linked. Um, and what happened was, you know, as we have the demand for chocolate, that's just one aspect, but it was also sugar uh, that they, they put in teas and in, in coffee and things like that. Uh, we started, they started to see the potential to grow vast sugar plantations in the Western Hemisphere, right? Um, and, and really, they first started with mining. You know, they started seeing the Spanish, you know, really started with trying to mine out the gold and the silver in the Western Hemisphere. But soon those mines played out. And as, like, the English colonists realized with Jamestown, they went there looking for gold and silver, and there is no gold and silver, right? So what do you do? Well, you turn to farming. And the first vast farms were sugar plantations. And they were in the West Indies. Uh, and they were in uh, places like Brazil. And I've kind of put little uh, yellow marks where you see them. Notice that there, there are, we, we really didn't grow sugar in colonial U.S. Uh, our first you know, cash crops was t were tobacco, right? But um, what's interesting about this is that the English abolitionist movement uh, actually linked sugar and slavery. And they cautioned, there was a whole abolitionist movement saying to consumers, stop eating sugar, right? Stop using sugar. And uh, they called this the, the sugar abstinence campaign. 
And it was part of the abolitionist movement. And here you're looking at an English uh, advertisement, you know, um, essentially part of that abstinence campaign of 1790, where you have a slave driver cooking a slave in sugar, in a vat of boiling sugar. Um, and I want you to read this quote, because this was 1791, part of the sugar campaign, uh, or abstinence campaign, the boycott of 1790, says, if we purchase this commodity, we participate in the crime, right? Putting the responsibility on the consumer, right? And it goes on to say, the slave dealer, the slave holder, the slave driver, are virtually all agents of the consumer and may be considered as employed and hired uh, by him to procure the commodity in every pound of sugar used. We may be considered as consuming two ounces of human flesh. This is William Fox, 1791. Now, so I was going to stop right around here with my lecture, and then I was talking, you know, I, I said, Chef Pierre, I think a chocolate tasting would be great, but I need to do a little lecture component. He said, I teach a class on chocolate, and I'll give you this CD, and you can, you can learn something about modern chocolate. I thought that's great. So I, I watched this uh, documentary called uh, The Dark Side of Chocolate. And I call up to Pierre, and I said, Pierre, I can't do chocolate. I, let's abandon this idea of a chocolate taste <laughs> because I can't eat chocolate ever again. <laughs> and you know, this is what's so fantastic. This is, this is what's so fantastic too about this series is I, I feel like I get to work with faculty, and I'm learning so much about my fellow faculty members, and I have learned. Uh, so much from Pierre, right? And you know, he gave me uh, this great CD, and that's where I'm um, now going to transition to the modern era. And I'm going to talk about uh, the year 2000. BBC did a documentary on an expose, really, on sugar, uh, or sorry, cacao. Not, not, I talked about the, the sugar in the past, but now it's cacao. Um, Ninety percent of farms in uh, West Africa, uh, primarily the Ivory Coast use slave labor. Uh, slavery, as I inform my students, still exists today. Uh, and it's sometimes in a cacao plantation, coffee plantation. Sometimes they're sex slaves in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, most of these slaves are children in West Africa. 70% of uh, cacao beans come from West Africa. Uh, and finally, after this big expose in 2001, they came out with the Harkin Engel Protocol. They tried to end child slavery in Africa, West Africa. And they put the date at 2005. Then 2005 came and went, and they extended it to 2008. And then they extended it again to 2010. This brings us to the great documentary that Chef Pierre gave me, which is The Dark Side of Chocolate. It's on YouTube. I recommend it to all of you. And uh, it showed 2010, little has changed, right? Uh, and this Time article, uh, this Time, it was, it was on the cover, actually. And notice this is a, a carved chocolate with a young child holding a cacao bean. Um, it said that the brands, the great brands, Hershey, Nestle, uh, Ferrero Rocher, which I love those little gold chocolates, you know? They're all, they're all part of this. Yes, it's horrible, I know. Thank you, Pierre. <laughs> he, by the way, he gave me a stack of CDs, and he said, you know, I'm a vegetarian. And I said, I can't, you know what? <laughs> I like my meat, Pierre. Um, what can we do? I want to end this on a positive note. I passed out this uh, flyer. We can buy certified uh, free, free trade chocolate. And that's exactly what Pierre did. And he went out, and he bought uh, free trade chocolate for this demo. So we are eating right, chocolate today that was not born on the backs of children right, in West Africa. But I, I really encourage you to check out. I discovered in all of this, I started doing all this research because I'm like, oh my gosh. What, you know, you suddenly realize, and I'm thinking back to that 1791 campaign and that comment that we are responsible to as consumers. And so um, I found this CNN Freedom Project, which is an attempt to end modern day slavery. And it's uh, an ambitious, you know, uh, I think campaign. But look at what has happened. And I want to point out that, um, you know, there have been updates. Nestle is, is now fighting uh, to try to end child slavery. 
Ferrer Rocher sets an end to, to try to end slavery in West Africa. Hershey pledged $10 million to improve uh, West African um, farming and fight child labor. So, you know, you, you know the, the hand that I've given you, there have been, this has all been in just the last few months, right? Six months this has happened. So update yourself, educate yourself. Uh, and as consumers, right, uh, go out there and try to do your part. And, uh, you know, this brought me this question to Chef Pierre, which is, I said, Chef, how are you a chef? <laughs> I said, my gosh, how do you make decisions that, you know, come, you come up with all these ethical questions. You know, you teach a class on chocolate. I mean, how don't you feel bad? And, and so I wanted him to just say something about this. <laughs> and by the way, he's wearing this wonderful African hat in uh, solidarity with uh, West African right, uh, people. So please, Pierre, answer the question. <laughs> um, if, you, if you are able to, to use, um, like for the home consumption, and as much as I can, when I use in the classroom, I use the best chocolate. I mean, I use chocolate that I know is, uh, is uh, safety. Uh, it happened that the best chocolate is actually not from Africa. It's from South and Central and South America, Venezuela, and all that. So we try as much as we can to, to use that chocolate. A lot of the chocolate I, I use is given to me. Uh, the, the, the supplier, when they have chocolate that's not about to expire, they they give it to us. Um, so if I, I don't have the luxury to ask them, but uh, as much as I can, yes. And where do you buy your chocolate that is, you know, fair trade, slave-free, Venezuelan? Uh, well, there is a French brand called Valrona, and I can uh, V uh, V V L H R O N A. Is that on? Is that online, or can you? You can it? find it online if you put Valrona chocolate. Uh, and I know their chocolate is from South America. And uh, there are several brands also of uh, uh, chocolate from Venezuela that you can buy. Um, yes, for the home and everything, when we buy, yes, when we buy chocolate, this is my wife trying to tell, to tell me to pass the, this is the cover <laughs> from the, you can take one, and I have nine of them. <laughs> for the house, buy, buy, you know, you, it's easy if, because you don't need so much chocolate. Oh, vitamin C. Yeah, vitamin C. We yeah, shop that's where, that's yeah. where I shop, yeah. Yes, too. And buy the, 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 the free trade. I mean, free trade, I mean that the people who cultivated were, you know, treated atlantically and they were paid a fair wage. And so it's a little bit more expensive, but it's worth it. And usually it's a better chocolate anyway. Uh, and, um, you know, you have to make a choice. It's like if you, there is a, um, Voltaire said that you, you cultivate your own garden, mm -hmm. so you, you, you cultivate what you choose and what you want. Um, having said that, going back to my demonstration, uh, do you have any questions about, yes? Could you tell us about the thermometers you're using to? Oh, burn? yes. I, um, oops. The chocolate, like I was telling you, you have to go to that melting temperature, so you can either use a thermometer that you put it in, like this one. And this is cheap, you can buy it at Bed Bath & Beyond, mm -hmm. and you bring your 20% off coupon, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it works both in Celsius and in Fahrenheit, and this is an infrared thermometer, it's, it's got a laser on it. So it, it, it reads on, on contact, and what I do when I, when I use it, I, I stir the chocolate, so I make sure that I, I'm not only looking at the temperature of the surface, but the inside, and uh, that tell me exactly the temperature that is. And plus, it's very convenient because you don't have to, you know, if this one it makes a mess when you put it on the table, and this, is, this is very nice. And it's funny because that technology, I mean, it's not really new, but it's, Two, three years ago, nobody used that in the kitchen, and now everybody's using those things. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the way you want to temper it, you want to warm it up over a double boiler. You, you never, uh, you don't want a chocolate melt around 90 degrees, water, water boil at 212. 
so you don't want the water, the boiling water to touch the chocolate. Oh. So you melt it, stirring it all the time, because the chocolate on the outside is going to melt, but the chocolate in the middle is not. So you need to stir it. Once you have the temperature of 50 degrees, which is about 118, you, um, you want to cool it down. So there are many different ways to cool it down. You can add chocolate that has not melted, that has the white crystal in it, and it promotes a good crystallization. Uh, you can put it on a piece of marble or granite and cool it down like that, and then put it back in there and cool the whole thing down. Or you can, uh, you can uh, put it on ice a little bit. And um, uh, on, on the ice, what's going to happen is that whatever touch the ice is going to cool down really fast, it's going to start crystallizing, and then you just stir it and mix, mix those crystals with. Uh, with the rest of the chocolate. Or you can just let it cool down slowly, stirring it one in a, once in a while like I did today. Uh, if you, uh, you can warm up and melt chocolate many times. This one I warmed it up yesterday, the day before yesterday, yesterday and today. <laughs> and it's still very good, I mean, as long as you don't contaminate it with anything. Um, for the candy I'm making today, I'm using toasted almonds. So to toast almonds is really easy, just put them on a tray like this and put them in the oven at 350, 325, 350, and, um, and check them. Look, when you have that nice golden color, don't rely on your nose, because if you smell them, they are, they are burnt. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't put a timer, you're going to burn them too. So put a timer. And put a timer like at five minutes. Those took like nine minutes, but I put a timer at five, and I went to check them, and, and then I run out because I remember. Uh, so there is no precise recipe. You can put more almond, less almond, if you want more chocolate or less chocolate. And uh, you just mix them in, and then with a, a tiny ice cream scoop or a two teaspoon, you uh, make a little amount on the, on the tray and, and let, them, let them set. Any questions? So here is my chocolate. And it has cooled down slowly, nicely. Yeah, that's not the best. Chef here? Yes. In the refrigerator? Or just set out? Uh, no, outside. Outside, okay. Yeah. And you don't want to refrigerate the almond either, because then you have that moisture that's going to go in the chocolate. Well, something I forget to tell you is that the number one enemy of chocolate is water. Mm -hmm. So I happen to use the same bowl, but if I had put that chocolate inside the, with the almond, I have to make sure that I fire the bottom of the bowl. Because if the water goes in, my chocolate is going to seize, and it's going to be ruined. So I just mix it. I can tell that I have a bit too much chocolate, so I'm going to put more almonds. What temperature do you want the chocolate to be at? Uh, 30 degrees. And you can mix it as it cools down because it's going to be fine because it's been done good. 30 Celsius. It'll be frozen. Um, fine height, it's. Um, I don't know. <laughs> but if you get this thing, you know, you just can switch from. Uh, <laughs> or even this one as a switch. Okay, so it's mixed. And then I take a tray. And I have a parchment paper, which is the paper we use to bake on, but you can use, um, you can use um, wax paper. You could even use um, the plastic thing, film. That would work too. You don't, maybe not want to put it on the tray because it might get stuck. And then I take two spoons. <coughs> and I'm just gonna scoop them. Like that. And uh, if you, uh, when you make it, you find that they run, they get flat, just wait a little bit, let the chocolate uh, set a little bit and they, they're going to stay, they're going to keep the shape better. 
Uh, don't wait too long, otherwise the, he's going to get stuck in the ball. Uh, and if you don't like the way they look, you can take some white chocolate and make some little line on it. <laughs> <laughs> and you can do, uh, you can make it with any um, any kind of chocolate. It can be milk, it can be white chocolate. Uh, the only uh, difference is the temperature is going to be a little bit different. Like a milk chocolate, you're not going to eat it to 30 to uh, 50 degrees, maybe 47 or 48. But usually, when you buy a good chocolate. Um, they, well, in big quantity, they, you have uh, on the package, they tell you what are the temperature for tempering. Maybe if you buy a chocolate like that, you can, uh, I would say, just look online. You know, milk, chocolate, tempering, temperature. Look a couple of, uh, of websites and it will tell you what are the temperature that you should uh, uh, follow. Okay, so. The chocolate is getting a little cold. I could, yes. But the lazy person in me doesn't want to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this is a... It's a 70% cacao, so it's very strong. And it's funny because that uh, chocolate doesn't behave like that. Oh, wow. So good. Who cares about diet? There is not very much fat in that chocolate. Unlike the milk or the white chocolate. White chocolate is not really chocolate because it has no uh, cocoa. Cocoa powder in it, it's only cocoa powder. <laughs> because of the cocoa butter, and I guess a marketing name, because you know, vanilla cocoa butter, nobody can buy it. And if you buy the coating, like I was uh, telling you about, the, the white chocolate coating is only fat and, yes. and vanilla flavor. There is no, nothing good in it. for a future Know Your College, Know Your Colleagues series. And if you uh, know of anyone who, either yourself or if there's something interesting you would like to see, I mean, uh, I'd love to hear some suggestions. We, we know our colleagues and uh, friends here on campus well. So uh, I was talking to Fred D.B. and I was asking him to, you know, and he was telling me about um, the book Freakonomics and how, you know, we as consumers are manipulated, you know, uh, I'm actually taking an online course from Duke University called Irrational Behavior. And, and it's interesting, things like in the, the, the supermarket, you know, not having the uh, dollar signs in front of the prices actually helps you um, spend more, right? And also, also the, you know, we're quarters, uh, humans are quarters, and so that, have you noticed, like, you know, 10 for, a, you know, 10 for 10. You know, the first time I actually bought 10, you know, avocados, and then I got home and I'm thinking, how are you eating 10 avocados? You know, why did I do that? You know, and uh, it's interesting. And so that was one thing he said, you know, Fred, maybe I was telling you about the course, and he's like, you know, you gotta read this book. Uh, and then I said, you should do a presentation on it. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> but um, I learned tricks from the technology department, right? How many people would be interested in something like that? Um, so kind of troubleshoot. Actually, the idea of uh, having Chef Frank 
come and do the bouquet cutting, you know, for vegetables and uh, fruits. Uh, I want to say Chef Pierre came up with that idea, but I recently found out it was his one. <laughs> uh, and um, so if you can think of anything that would be exciting or interesting, you know, this is a series meant to really showcase our strength uh, as faculty. And I'll tell you something, it's a great thing we're doing. And it's, it's great being involved, and I've learned so much about fellow, fellow faculty members. Uh, so I encourage you to please brainstorm. If you have an office mate that you think just may, uh, just may have something that, that they could offer or you do, please uh, write it down and, and submit it. I'll be collecting them after I give you your, your second little uh, chocolate. And thank you for coming. I just found out that uh, Christiane Warner said the flex credit, sadly, for the first and the eighth um, will not be available, I guess, the, the time for adjunct. For adjunct, sorry. Is it also for full time? Yeah. Just okay. <laughs> I, I have to. I have to check it out, but I guess it's just adjunct right now. Because the due date is the first. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess if you go to the conundrum of culture, you would have been there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 You are married to Chef Pierre, you don't eat chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wow. <laughs> All right, thank you, um, thank you Chef Pierre. Thank you, Wendy.